Hi, I'm Austin Andrus, and this is Ingenious Designs. When I posted my first bookbinding tutorial, my sister, ever brutally honest, responded, I bet that's a lot harder than you make it look. I've kept that feedback in mind since, and I've tried to include more of my mistakes in other videos. But I've also thought about some of the tips and tricks which I use to simplify my bookbinding process, but which haven't made it into a video. Until now. So, without further ado, let me show you some of my favorite bookbinding hacks. To start, let's discuss the feat that first made my sister skeptical. Trimming end papers in straight lines around a text block. With a regular knife, this really can be quite tricky. If you angle the blade toward the text, you run the risk of gouging the pages. On the other hand, if you angle the blade away from the text, then it tends to wander off course and you have to make multiple corrective cuts. My solution is to use a box cutter with a long breakaway blade. These blades are made from a flexible spring steel, and you can take advantage of that flex to get a perfect cut. By holding the cutter at an angle like this, the springiness of the steel keeps the end pressed right up against the text block, and a flat blade resting on the flat book will ensure that your cut is perfectly flush with the pages. Voila! No special talent needed. While we're on the topic of straight cuts, in a past video, I mentioned that I like to cut up cardboard tubes from rolls of vinyl to make my book spines. At the time, I had been watching a lot of YouTube magic videos, so this is the technique I demonstrated. But in reality, it can be kind of tricky to cut straight lines on round tubes. Time for this magician to reveal his secrets. I start by bracing the tube against a heavy piece of shameless self-promotion. Resting a ruler against the tube in this position will ensure that I cut straight down the length of the tube, provided that the ruler stays in place. I secure it with a piece of tape and then carefully draw my box cutter along the ruler. Doing this a couple of times won't usually be enough to cut straight through the tube, but it makes a groove that will guide your blade when you do make your final cut. Do it all once more and you will have a perfect book spine. I don't normally try to match the dimensions of my book when I'm first cutting up the tube. It's easier to just cut a bunch of spines of different widths and then pick the one that matches my book best and trim it if needed. Cannibalizing old vinyl tubes works great for smaller books, but what do you do when the book is wider than your tube? In this case, I like to use pieces of scrap chipboard that I usually have left over from making book covers. I run the board very briefly underwater, enough to make it damp but not soggy. Then I bend it around an appropriately sized cylinder. The future spine needs to dry in this position, but if you hold it in place with rubber bands, then they will press into the newly softened board and make it bumpy. So instead, I tightly roll a towel around the whole thing to apply even pressure. I do keep the towel in place with rubber bands, but they are only placed above and below the chipboard. 24 hours later, you can unwrap the package and Merry Christmas! You now have a strong spine curved to fit the largest books. One of my favorite things to do when rebinding books is to add gold foil to the page edges. But doing so requires extensively sanding the text block to a high polish. This can be problematic with older books where pages have collapsed into a curved shape. There are ways that I could trim the pages flat, of course, but then the text margins of the outer pages would appear much narrower than those in the center of the book. I use gravity to help me solve this problem. Instead of preparing the book for sanding in a horizontal position, I tip it vertically. I position these pieces of chipboard so that the text block will fall a little lower than the wood blocks on either side, and I press down on the book until the pages lie flat against the table. Then I clamp the whole thing in place for sanding. Speaking of sanding, here's a little bonus hack for you. I do believe that sanding pages manually is the best way to maintain control and get high quality results. But it is admittedly very tiring and time consuming, especially in the early stages, so I will often go through the first few grits of sandpaper using a palm sander or belt sander. Power tools like these are super fast and convenient and don't have to be expensive. You just have to be careful that they don't chew up too much of your pages. I still usually use regular sandpaper for higher grit polishing, but it's nice to let machines handle the hardest part. 
After these pages have been gilded, I release the clamp and they go back to their old curved shape. This means that you'll see the white of the pages when you look from the side, but you'll still get a mirror shine when you look straight on, so I think it's a decent compromise. Last but not least, one of the best things about rebinding books is that you can take completely different styles of books, and as long as they're the same size, you can turn them into a matched set. But what if one book is too small to fit in with the rest of the collection? In that case, you can get sneaky and disguise it as a bigger book. Problem solved. Well, the cat's out of the bag. It turns out I am not some super artist who always does things the hard way and gets it right the first time because I'm just that good. I cut my fair share of corners. And although I might not always include my time-saving hacks in the main tutorials, they do happen behind the scenes, and if you're interested, I can always make more short videos like this to include them. In the meantime, if you have other clever solutions to bookbinding woes of your own, please share them in the comments and we can all learn together. I look forward to seeing you there.